observed Niels Bohr, a little proverb about, you know, you've made the necessary mistakes. The evidence suggests that our emotions are very, very wise, and we ignore them. We don't take them seriously at our own peril. Now, you know, in a talk on decision-making, if I stopped here, I leave you with the impression that our emotions were these wondrous things that kept us from pushing fat men off bridges and having sex with our sister and, and saving the day when we're looking at radar screens. And, and, and our emotions do many wonderful things, but if I left you with the impression that the secret to good decision making was to always trust your feelings, to always trust your instincts, to just blink and go with your gut, uh, I, I would be giving you terrible terrible advice. I'd, I'd, leave, I'd leave you with a vastly oversimplified notion of how the mind works, because the truth of reality and the wonder of the mind is that you know, the world is a little too complex for there to, for to be one all-purpose solution to anything. And, and that's why your mind is so susceptible of, of different cognitive strategies. And one of the things I find most interesting about the neuroscience of decision-making is that you can see how the exact same mechanisms, the exact same cellular mechanisms, make us so smart in the radar room, on the battlefield, can also lead us to do profoundly idiotic things in a slightly different situation. And I'd like to illustrate this with the story of Anne Clanestiver, who was a high school English teacher in West Virginia uh, when she was diagnosed with Parkinson's in her early 50s. Parkinson's is caused by the massive cell death of dopamine neurons in the back of the brain and the brain area that's involved with bodily movement. And Anne suffered from all the usual movement problems, you know, temporary bouts of paralysis, the tremors, and, and her doctor put her on what's called a dopamine agonist. Uh, it's a very common treatment, one of the oldest treatments for Parkinson's, but still one of the most effective. And the basic idea of a dopamine agonist is like a synthetic form of dopamine. You flush the brain with a dopaminergic precursor and it allows the dopamine neurons that survive, that are still in the brain, to produce an amplified signal so, so it helps correct for the cell loss. And at, at first, as Anne described it to me, this, this drug was like a miracle cure. Uh, her movement problems all but disappeared. She could forget for hours at a time that she had Parkinson's. She went back to teaching. It was fantastic. One of the problems with dopamine agonists is that over time, people have to be put on higher and higher doses of the drug. Their, their dopamine neurons continue to die, and so you need higher doses to compensate for the cell loss. And that's when Anne discovered one of the terrible side effects of dopamine agonists, the side effect that some studies estimate afflicts between 8 to 15 percent of patients on dopamine agonists who have Parkinson's, and the side effect is gambling addiction. Anne became a compulsive gambler, slot machine addict. And, and for Anne, it, it all but ruined her life. She lost her entire life savings, a quarter of a million dollars. Um, her husband left her. Um, you know, she, she described a typical day to me like this when she was in the grip of her gambling addiction. She wake up at 5 in the morning and go to the local racino. It's a dog racing track where they had slot machines. And she'd be at the slots till about midnight. So that's a pretty long time to play the slots. Just get her bucket of quarters and just put one quarter after another into the machines. Then at midnight, the racino would close. And she'd go to the local convenience store, because it's West Virginia, the convenience store can have slot machines, where she'd continue to play the slots until 3 in the morning when the convenience store closed. Then she'd go home, play the slots on her computer, not for money, just for fun, until the racino opened again at 5. When she'd go back to the racino, she, she could keep this up for two to three days at a time. Um, she was living on peanut butter straight from the jar. She sold everything there was to sell. Um, her, her life all but fell apart. Um, and, and of course, the larger question that Anne's story begs is, why would a dopamine agonist, why would having a little too much dopamine sloshing around in your brain, why would that lead people to become gambling addicts? Gambling addicts. Why would it make a stupid one-armed bandit, a, a machine, machine, in a casino, machine in a casino, why would it make that so alluring that we'd spend all our life savings on it. And the answer gets back to the flip side of the prediction error signal. So let's say you've got these monkeys and you've trained them very well, you know. Play a song, flash a light, ring a bell, squirt of apple juice. They fire whenever you play the song. They've learned to predict this reward. What happens if sometimes you just give them squirts of apple juice out of the blue? So no bells, no songs, no lights, just a surprising squirt of apple juice. What happens then? Well, here's where you see dopamine neurons get very, very excited. It turns out that the best tasting squirts of apple juice are these surprising squirts of apple juice. And according to Schultz's work, a surprising squirt of juice generates a surge of dopamine that's three to four times larger than a predictable reward. 
And this also makes a little bit of sense. What your neurons are trying to do is get you to pay attention. Here you've discovered this unexpected reward, this unexpected squirt of apple juice. Where did it come from? Maybe there's a pattern there you can find, in which case you'll be able to predict it farther in advance and maybe get some more. You know, it's trying to grab your attention, make you pay attention so you'll find the reward. Now, now think about this in terms of slot machines. So over the long term, everyone loses at the slots, right? They're programmed, depending on the casino and the state, to return somewhere between 75 and 90 cents in the dollar. So nobody wins at the slots. But in the short term, you're getting these surprising squirts of juice, so to speak. Every once in a while, you put in a quarter and you get a bunch of quarters in return. The lights go off, the coins clang. It's a very exciting thing. Your dopamine neurons are titillated. You know, very titillated, precisely because it's surprising. And so they generate this large surge of dopamine, try to grab your attention, try to get you to find the pattern that predicts this reward, so that the surprising reward is no longer surprising, so you can maximize you know, whatever it is you're trying to maximize. But here's the secret of slot machines, it's that there is no secret, that, that, that there is no pattern to find. Your dopamine neurons, these dumb little cells, they'll never find the thing that predicts the clanging coins and the sirens going off, because it's just a random number generator in the slot machine. There is nothing to predict. But, of course, your dopamine neurons don't know that. No one's told them about Las Vegas or Atlantic City or Racinos in West Virginia. So they keep on generating these search. So every time you get a reward, you generate the same surprising squirt of dopamine. It's like getting a surprising squirt of juice. And your dopamine neurons can never adapt. And, and, and so one of the theories for why there's this link between dopamine agonists and compulsive gambling is that when your brain is simply too flush with synthetic dopamine, with this dopamine-like substance. Uh, it's simply too alluring. The this, this surge is simply too powerful, and so you can't look away. So that even though you know you're ruining your life, even though you know this is the one thing you shouldn't be doing, it's simply too exciting, too titillating, too, too alluring, and so you just keep on putting one quarter after another into the machines. So, so now I've given you a kind of a crash course in dopamine and, and in our emotions and when they're great and, and how sometimes they lead us to do really, really stupid things and throw our life away. The, the, the real important question to me, I think, is how can we actually make use of this knowledge? How can we take all this new stuff coming out of neuroscience labs, all this exciting new knowledge about the human mind, about these three pounds of gelatinous meat stuffed inside our head, how can we actually apply it to, to everyday life? And, and here is where I think one of my favorite words comes into play, and I love this word because it sounds very smart and fancy and intellectual, but it's actually the simplest thing in the world, and the word is metacognition. Uh, and, and put simply, metacognition is thinking about thinking. Um, whether or not we know it, it's something we all do all the time. To take one of my favorite examples, um, you know, when you're walking down the street, and you see someone and you know you know their name. It's on the tip of your tongue, but you just can't quite produce it. Yeah, I, I always said this was a very profound little mental hiccup because how do you know you know something if you don't actually know it right then? You know, if you can't produce the memory, why are you so convinced that the memory's in here? Uh, well, it turns out that's the metacognition work. At any given moment, we're keeping an inventory of all the ideas and feelings and memories stuffed inside our head, and, and we're trying to constantly figure out, well, well, what's in there? We're thinking about thinking, and that's what produces. This, this frustrating moment of, oh, God, I know I know their name, but I just can't quite produce it. But when it comes to decision making, metacognition allows you to do a few things that are very, very important to making good decisions. The first thing is avoiding unnecessary mistakes. So at this point, psychologists come up with a long list of biases and heuristics and, and, and flaws that have been built into the brain. To take but one very simple example, something called loss aversion. It's a very simple bias to demonstrate. It was first discovered by Dan Danny Kahneman and Amos Fersky back at Hebrew University in the early 70s. Um, and, and, you know, I can show loss version. So I'm going to make you guys a bet. I'm going to flip a coin. And if it's heads, you pay me a dollar. If it's tails, how much do I have to pay you before you'll accept the bet? So if I offer you a dollar and ten cents, who would accept that bet? So we've got a few rational souls here. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I saw the same people who would, who would have pushed the man off the footbridge. Uh, um, but, but, so, you know, an economist would say you should take that bet, because over the long term that bet's going to pay off. Most people say, $1.10, are you crazy? I have a $1.25. People still say no, $1.50, you get a few more hands. 
turns out that for most people all across the world, you have to offer them at about $1.75 or $2 before they'll accept a dollar bet on the flip of a coin. And, and the way we explain this behavior, the way Tversky and Kahneman did, is that losses hurt more than gains feel good. That if we were perfectly rational, we would treat losses and gains equivalently. But that's not the way we're built at all. And this isn't just about stupid coin flips. This is true across all sorts of human interactions. It's why, you know, for every critical thing you say to your spouse, so you have to say five nice things to make up for it. Um, you know, I know as a writer, you get a nice review and it makes you happy for about 30 seconds. You get a nasty review, it ruins your month. Um, we're, we're very sensitive to losses, to criticism as part of a larger category called negativity bias. But, but loss aversion actually is very real, everyday practical consequences. So one of my favorite studies is the my Terry Odin at UC Berkeley, who looked at how people make decisions of which stocks to buy or sell. You, know, you get your stock portfolio every month and you're trying to figure out, should I keep Google or sell it? Should I you know, keep GM or sell it? Hopefully you sold GM. Um, <laughs> And, and you know, it's, a, it, it, it's a tough decision, so how do people make this decision? Well, it turns out that people are much more likely to sell stocks that have gone up in value. Right? They're, they're, they, you know, if, if Google's done well, you're much more likely to sell it than a stock which has actually gone down in value. And the reason seems to be is that stocks that have gone down in value trigger loss aversion. That if we sold that stock, we would make the loss tangible. That's such a terrible feeling to actually make, take a loss on a stock you've invested in that we try to postpone the loss for as long as possible. The unfortunate result, though, is that we end up incurring more losses because we're stuck with a stock portfolio composed entirely of losing shares because we've sold all our winners. <laughs> this is why, according to Odeon, these stocks people sell outperform the stocks they keep by about 3.5% every year, which compounded over the lifetime of retirement savings account is actually a pretty big deal. And all gets back to loss aversion. So what does metacognition allow you to do? Well, next time you buy and sell stocks, you know, you've learned about loss aversion, you, it's important to think, well, why am I making this decision? Is it because I should actually sell the stock because I've got a good reason to sell it? Because my unconscious has, has done the computations and knows this is actually a good thing to get rid of? or you're simply falling victim to loss aversion. Unless you know about loss aversion, unless you're self-aware, you're going to make the same mistake that people have been making forever. You're going to sell stocks that are going up in value, and you're going to fall victim to all the usual biases and irrational ticks that have simply been built into our brain. That's the first thing metacognition allows you to do, is avoid avoidable errors. The second thing it allows you to do is to outsmart yourself, so to speak. And, and I'd like to illustrate this by, by talking about one of my favorite psychology experiments, which took place just down the road at Stanford. It was done by a scientist named Walter Michel. Uh, this is the famous marshmallow task. Uh, it took place in the late 60s, early 70s, and what Walter did is he brought four-year-olds at the big nursery school, brought four-year-olds into his lab, and he offered them a choice. He said, you can have one marshmallow right now, or if you wait 15, 20 minutes while I run an errand, you can have a second marshmallow. Not surprisingly, it's about every four-year-old said, oh, I'll wait, I'll wait, no problem, I want a second marshmallow. And here's where Walter saw this bell curve, of the standard bell curve of human behavior. Some kids were great at waiting. They could really wait the full 15 minutes. Some kids would wait two and a half minutes. Some kids could wait 30 seconds. Some kids would pop the marshmallow in their mouth before he left the room. Um, one of my favorite kids, uh, he's, he's, he's got videos of, of, of all these studies. Uh, it's this cute little four-year-old boy. And it's called the marshmallow task, but Walter actually gave the kids a choice of marshmallows, pretzel sticks, and Oreo cookies. And this little boy chose Oreo cookies. And uh, 30 seconds go by on the tape, and you can see he's really struggling. This is not an easy thing for him to resist. He's got these two cookies just sitting on the table right in front of him. So 30, 45 seconds, he starts to look around the room, making sure the scientist really has left and it's safe. And he conveniently ignores the video camera right here and the large one-way mirror right here. And when he's satisfied that no one is in the room, he picks up one of the Oreo cookies, carefully unspools it, licks off the white cream filling, puts it back together, <laughs> puts it down, and then he had no problem waiting the full 15 minutes. So, so Walter did this for hundreds of kids. The, 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 the most adorable, charming videos you can imagine. And, and his, you know, what he's really interested in is what allows some kids to wait the full 15 minutes? What accounts for delayed gratification? And his initial hypothesis was that some kids just wanted the marshmallow more. That maybe they were denied sweets at home, maybe they never had a marshmallow before, maybe they just 